In the year of our Lord 1641, a faint light could be seen in a window in the city of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Long into the night, an evil demon, uh, sorry, a philosopher was writing about an evil demon trying to finish his book. I am of course talking about René Descartes making the finishing touches to his book Meditations on First Philosophy, which was published the same year. Descartes was a night owl when he was working. He writes about this in his book. This happened while one of the most brutal wars in history was ravaging Europe, the Thirty Year War in the Holy German Empire. But there was also another war fought in Europe at the time, a war of a different kind, a war with murders and torture nonetheless, the war on evil. Just eight years earlier, in 1633, Galileo was condemned by the Italian Inquisition after the Inquisitor Vincenzo Marculani had, under threat of torture, got him to confess that he might have given the impression to a reviewer that he supported a Copernican worldview. This in turn led Descartes to abandon his book plan, a book that he had been working on for four years, Treaties on the World, which also included calculations of astronomical nature. In this environment, it was a bold move from Descartes in 1641 to include the thought exercise of the evil demon in his new book, and even more bold to mention that the evil demon thought exercise was epistemologically equivalent to a scenario of a deceiver god. Hi guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Dave. This video is number two in a mini-series about the brain and a vat thought experiment. In the last video I talked about perception as it relates to the brain and a vat. In this video I'm going to have a look at a historical view of the brain and a vat and some of what we can learn from it. This video will be listed in a playlist called Building My Worldview. This is not an educational channel and all my videos are opinionated. I also assume you guys have at least some knowledge of the topics I discuss. The background picture on this video is taken approximately 150 meters away from the picture used in the first video about the brain in a vat. It's from a place called Tomme in Rannu commune in Tartu county in Estonia. I have spent many summers in this area my wife is from around there. I also want to mention that you can adjust the playback speed of the video on the little toot wheel in the bottom right of your video window. Descartes' evil demon thought exercise. In meditations on first philosophy he call it evil genius. But quickly it's clear that we are not talking about some genius person or human. This thought exercise is what over time has turned into what we today know as the brain in a vat thought experiment. This is what Descartes writes about the evil demon in Meditations on First Philosophy. I shall then suppose that not God, who is supremely good and the fountain of all truth, Descartes has just speculated around a scenario with the deceiver God, but some evil genius, nonetheless powerful than deceitful, has employed his whole energies in deceiving me. I shall consider that the heavens, the earth, colors, figures, sound, and all other external things are nothing but illusions and dreams of which this genius have availed himself in order to lay traps for my credulity. I shall consider myself as having no hands, no eyes, no flesh, no blood, nor any senses, yet falsely believing myself to possess all these things. I shall remain obstinately attached to this idea, and if by this means it is not in my power to arrive at the knowledge of any truth, I may at last do what is in my power, and with firm purpose avoid giving credence to any false things, or being imposed upon by this arch-deceiver, however powerful and deceptive he might be. 
I think it's clear that he imagines himself as having nothing that belongs to the physical realm. Before this, in the book, Descartes also mentioned the dream argument. He writes, At the same time, I must remember that I am a man and that consequently I am in the habit of sleeping. And in my dreams, representing to myself the same things or sometimes even less probable things than do those who are insane in their waking moments. How often has it happened to me that in the night I dream that I found myself in this particular place, that I was dressed and seated near the fire whilst in reality I was lying undressed in bed. At this moment it does indeed seem to me that it is with eyes awake that I am looking at this paper, that this head which I move is not asleep, that it is deliberately and of set purpose that I extend my hand and perceive it. What happens in sleep does not appear so clear nor so distinct as does all this. All of this is mentioned in the first meditations of the book named Of the Things which may be brought within the spheres of the doubtful. The thought exercises of the evil demon, the dream analogy and the deceiver god is mentioned as thought exercises to bring about a form of fundamental doubt to investigate if underneath our layers of knowledge that for the most part is about the reality we experience on a day-to-day -day basis there might be some core truth that is raised above all doubt, an a priori truth about reality. This is the method Descartes uses to come to his most famous realization, Ego Cogito Ergo Sum. In the book uh, Meditations on First Philosophy it's formulated like this. But I was persuaded that there was nothing at all in the world, that there was no heaven, no earth, that there was no minds, nor any bodies. Was I not then likewise persuaded that I did not exist? Not at all. Of a surety I myself did exist since I persuaded myself of something. But there is some deceiver or other, very powerful and very cunning, whoever employs his ingenuity in deceiving me, then without doubt I exist also if he deceives me, and let him deceive me as much as he will, he can never cause me to be nothing, so as long as I think that I am something. So that after having reflected well and carefully, examined all things, we must come to the definite conclusion that this proposition, I am, I exist, is necessarily true each time that I pronounce it or that I mentally conceive it. Even though it seems like Descartes has come up with this on his own, it's not a completely new thought. The Muslim philosopher Ibn Sina, who lived from 980 to 1037, made a thought experiment that has been called the floating man. He imagines a man coming into existence fully formed with no contact with his sensory system, floating or falling in air. He realizes from this that the floating man would not have been able to realize that there is a physical reality, but that he would be able to conclude that he himself exists. Ibn Sina concludes from this that the floating man must have an immaterial soul. I reject to this conclusion, remember the man still has a brain and Ibn Sina doesn't, it seems, rule out that consciousness could be an emergent property of the brain. Anyway, I give Ibn Sina credit for coming up with, to an equivalent idea as Ego Cogito Argo Sum some 600 years before Descartes. As far as I know, Descartes doesn't mention anything about an immaterial soul, even though he, in the thought exercises, imagined himself to be, a, be conscient without any physical attributes. I don't count the floating man as equivalent to the evil demon because it doesn't include an alternative reality where deception is taking place. In Islam, this knowledge of oneself is called knowledge by presence. I might touch into it when I make my video about the Ego Cogito Ergo Sum,
but uh, that will have to wait. I feel I'm finished with researching Descartes for now. There are many versions of the brain in a vat, or evil demon thought experiment. The oldest one I've come across is the parable of the butterfly dream in Zhuangzi by Chang Tzu from the later warring state periods in China, 476 to 201 BC. The parable of the butterfly dream goes like this. Once Chuang Tzu dreamt he was a butterfly, a butterfly flitting and fluttering about, happy with himself doing as he pleased. He didn't know that he was Chuang Tzu. Suddenly he woke up and there he was, solid and unmistakably Chuang Tzu. But he didn't know if he was Chuang Tzu who dreamt he was a butterfly, or a butterfly dreaming that he was Chuang Tzu. Between Chuang Tzu and the butterfly, there must be some distinction. This is called the transformation of things. Interestingly, as a curiosity, I will mention that Descartes also touches into the idea of the blue and the red pill in his book. The idea references the movie Matrix with Gnu Reeves from 1999. I don't recognize any other colored pill that people have proposed to mix into this idea. Those who propose them seems to have a completely different opinion about the ID. The blue and the red pill is a hypothetical question that goes like this. If given a choice between living in an illusion or deception of reality that one is comfortably habituated into, or waking up to a reality, a true reality that one knows little about, what would one choose? Descartes writes. And, just as a captive who in sleep enjoys an imaginary liberty, when he begins to suspect that his liberty is but a dream, fears to awaken, and conspires with these agreeable illusions that the deception might be prolonged, so insensibly for my own accord I fall back into my former opinions. And I dread awakening from this slumber, lest the laborious wakefulness which would follow the tranquillity of this repose should have to be spent, not in daylight, but in the excessive darkness of the difficulties which we just have been discussed. I feel it's necessary to explain what I mean by the term epistemologically equivalent. It describes two or more scenarios or hypotheses that is impossible in any way to distinguish between for us, for one reason or another. If one is true, we have no way of knowing or investigating which one this is. The proposition don't have to be similar, it's just that we can't know which one of them is true. I like to simplify this with a box example. Let's say we have a box with a glued lid. Inside the box there is a marble. And now we want to know what color the marble is. But we don't want to destroy or damage the box. Let's also say we don't have access to any advanced equipment like x-ray or whatever to see inside the box. One uh, hypothesis is that the marble is red. And another is that the marble is blue. But since in this case... Uh, there is no way for us to find out, the two hypotheses is epistemologically equivalent. When Descartes describes the deceiver god and the evil demon scenarios as epistemologically equivalent, this is what he means. If one is true, there would be no way for us to know which one of them this is. There is also a whole array of other thought experiment and hypotheses that is the same way epistemologically equivalent with the evil demon and the deceiver god. First is the brain in a vat thought experiment that this video is about, and the matrix, which is just an extension of the brain in a vat. And I mentioned above the parable of the butterfly dream and the dream hypothesis. Boltzmann's brain is a scenario originating in ideas by the Austrian physicist Ludwig Boltzmann, 1844-1906. Ludwig Bolt Boltzmann realized that according to probability calculation within physics, it is more likely that the brain has popped into existence in void, fully formed with false memory of having existed in reality as we experience it, 
than that the universe would form the way described by astrophysicists. This scenario differs from the brain in, a in that here there is no mind controlling events, but is equivalent in that it describes the exp uh, experienced reality as not being the real reality and that we wouldn't know whether this I is the case. So I count it amongst the scenarios that is epistemologically equivalent. The Ampalos hypothesis is a word used to describe various versions of creationism, especially the young earth variations. The name stem from a book called Omphalos by Philip Goose from 1857. Notice that this is two years before Charles Darwin published The Origin of Species. Goose was a Christian attending meetings in the Royal Society as Darwin was testing and reviewing his theory of evolution by natural selection. And he thought that Darwin's reasonings was sound. Yet, instead of giving up his belief in a young earth, he went straight to work constructing an alternative hypothesis. Namely, that God has created the universe at some point in our recent history, probably some 6,500 years ago or something, but intentionally with the appearance of being old. Fossils, geological strata, tree rings, even the fact that we can see distant stars, was all created with the sole intention to fool us into believing that the universe is older than it is. If you search for Ompolos on the internet, you will find pictures of strange ancient carved stones, but the word Omphalos means navel in Greek. This is in the book mentioned as a reference to Adam in paradise's navel. Goose believed that God would have created Adam and Eve with navels, giving them the appearance of having a mother. The book at the time got a horrible reception from both atheists and Christians alike, even though the reasoning in the book from the judgment of those who have reviewed it is logically consistent. The idea that there is an almighty God that deceives us on a day-to-day -day basis was too much to bear. I think it is obvious that Goose hadn't read Descartes, or he must have understood that the implications of suggesting a deceiver God. Descartes himself shrugged off the idea that the Almighty God could be a deceiver by saying that he, God, cannot be a deceiver, since the light of nature teaches us that fraud and deception necessarily proceed from some defect. So a perfect God cannot, according to Descartes, deceive. But a closer inspection today would reveal to everyone a grave mistake that Descartes is doing here. When he is writing, the light of nature teaches us. Wasn't the whole idea of the thought experiment not to take into consider what empirical studies of nature had taught us? This is the fundamental idea of Descartes' method called the Cartesian doubt. I have to say, this seems to me to be a so rookie mistake that I suspect that Descartes has put it in there for another reason. Maybe to avoid the attention from the formerly mentioned Italian Inquisition. I don't know. Then again, we all must make mistakes from time to time. For me, it seems to be a limitation not to be able to do something, no matter what that thing proceeds from. So it seems it could be interpreted as blasphemous, both to suggest that God can deceive and also that he can't. It's just confusing. Anyway, I also disagree in that deception always proceeds from some defect, and especially that we may learn this from nature. I don't even see how anyone can interpret deception as always malicious. God is sometimes portrayed as God the Father. And what do fathers do? This is a different topic, I'm sorry. It reminds me of one of the arguments I used when Christians tried to convert me as a child, that God in the Bible in many places seems to either withhold information or outright lie, joined with the omniscience and omnipotence. God holds all the cards. 
if an almighty God has created the universe we live in, the sensory system that we perceive it with, and the brains that we understand it with, there is nothing we can do. Even if this existence on earth is just a precursor to some next life together with God in heaven, this is so poorly communicated that it's a kind of deception on its own. And especially if this is revealed to some people but not to all. If God is almighty and created the universe, it created me an atheist. This, but already when Descartes mentioned as deceiver God, puts the Ompalos uh, and other versions of deceiver God ideas firmly within the category of epistemologically equivalent with the brain and avat. Actually, I'm quite happy that Ompalos book exists because it has helped me to formulate my biggest problem with almost all forms of creationism, namely this. If Philip Goose is right, if he hit the nail on its head, so to speak, with the Ompalos, the deception has failed, didn't it? Goose with his book has revealed God's deception that God has gone to so extremes to hide. And then we must conclude that God is not omnipotent or seeant, at least not when it comes to deceiving. Alternatively, Goose is wrong and we are back to the earth is as old as it seems. The hypothesis is in a way self-defeating. To me, it's almost strange that uh, an actual Christian would seriously propose a hypothesis that is so damaged for theism. Even if Goose's bo book flopped in its time, the idea that God has purposely or by coincidence built deception into the fabric of the creation is, in my opinion, an element of all forms of creationism today, both young and old while the evidence that evolution of life, the cosmos and everything has come about through natural processes is piling up. The room for there being a divine power having any part of it is shrinking. Unless, of course, you know, it's all just deception. The reductio ad absurdum of the Ompalos hypothesis is lost Thursdayism which is a thought experiment or mock religion that proposes that the universe was created complete with false memories and light already on the way from distant stars last Thursday. Alternatively, it could have been created five minutes ago for that part. It doesn't matter. An all-powerful deceiver god can really do what he wants. Also taken into consideration what we learned from the Boltzmann's brain and the evil demon, if the intention of God is to deceive humans, it would not make sense to bother creating a universe at all. They might just as well just project the images of reality straight into some form of consciousness. Even a brain like we think of it is not necessary. In case there is a God that has created the reality we are in, the reality where God is, is the real reality. This is just a creation. From all the scenarios I have mentioned so far in the video, I consider the deceiver God to be most likely. The one where Descartes fails to realize that if it's true, his notion of the light of nature, who has taught him that deception necessarily proceeds from some defect, is a part of the deception created by the deceiver God. The Boltzmann's brain is suffering from a related problem. If it's true that we, or I, am a fantasy of a Boltzmann's brain, the parameters Ludwig Boltzmann used to calculate the probability that the Boltzmann's brain is more likely is also a part of the Boltzmann's brain's illusion of reality. The last hypothesis I will mention that is epistemologically equivalent, the elephant in the room, so to say, is drum roll, the idea that external reality the reality that we are experiencing is in fact the real reality and that it is, as it seems, naturally occurring. If this hypothesis was not epistemologically equivalent with the others, meaning if there was a way for us to distinguish this from the others, there wouldn't be a need for this video. So here we are then, 
with a lot of different ideas and no sure way to come to a solution. Still, even though there is no way of knowing for sure, I claim that the last hypothesis, that reality that we are experiencing is the real reality, is the only rational choice to believe as true. The reason for this is Occam's razor. I will certainly make a future video about Occam's razor since I consider it a crucial tool for rational thinking, but for now I will just explain what the razor is in short and why I think it applies to this situation. What is generally considered the razor statement is, other things being equal, simpler explanations are generally better than more complex ones. All the experiments that I have mentioned, except for the last one, have one thing in common, namely that the perceived reality is not a real reality. Just to recap, the hypothesis and thought experiments I have talked about is the brain in a vat and the matrix, evil demon, deceiver god, dream hypothesis and Swang Su's dream, Boltzmann's brain, the umpalos, and last Thursdayism. All of these can be summed up with the common denominator, perceived reality is not the real reality. The alternative is perceived reality is the real reality. So that is our two choices. So either there is some kind of delusion going on or not. Occam's razor dictates that the rational choice is to exclude the element that is not needed. In this case, that is the deception part since we already have an epistemologically equivalent hypothesis that doesn't include deception. Thus, I conclude that the rational thing to believe is that the perceived reality is the real reality. But you know, brain in a vat is a fun thought experiment. I love to be right, and that is the reason I urge you to correct me if I'm wrong. This counts for all my videos, Please write a comment below or contact me with some of the contact information I provide in the description. Especially I hope to hear from you if you think I have said something that is factually wrong. Wikipedia should be sufficient sources for most of what I'm saying, but if you struggle to find sources for anything, please notify me in the commentary section and I will get straight to work providing it. Thank you for the view and have a nice day.